The short game is listener supported on Patreon. If you'd like to support the show and join us on our Discord, head to theshortgame.net or patreon.com slash the short game. Welcome back to The Short Game. This is a show about short video games, games that respect your time. I'm Reagan Kelly, and I am joined this week by several very excellent co-hosts. Laura Nash. Pizza Heininger. <laughs> Pizza. <laughs> we need to, well, we'll get to this in a second. Uh, we are talking this week about Chicory, uh, which is the latest game from a team headed by Greg Lubinov. Uh, who was the lead developer of uh, Wander Song, which we covered. I can't believe how long ago it was. It felt like it was like yesterday, and then I looked it up, and it was like 2017, and that feels like ancient history. Really? I had a very fun uh, breakdown on that episode because I played Wander Song right after the uh, Kavanaugh hearings. So, oh, God. So yeah, I was having was so time. many feelings on Wander Song. Um, this also had feelings, but I'm in a better place. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Me too. Um, and there's this is a really it feels like a, a bit of a companion piece to Wander Song. We'll get into why, but uh, it's uh, I, I I'm I really had a lovely time with this game. So yeah. first of all, to to get the details right, um, the the team that developed this game does not have a, a quirky moniker. Uh, they just list their names pretty much everywhere. So uh, even on the title screen of the game, for example, it'll say like a game by Greg and Lena and etc. So uh, we can just list out the small team that developed this. Uh, Greg Lobanov uh, or Lobanov is the lead developer, and uh, he is assisted in this one by Lena Rain, the composer, which Woo. I was very excited to see because yes. I love her work. Yes, yeah, the um uh, the composer behind the soundtrack to Celeste, among other. Excellent soundtracks. M. Halberstadt, sound designer. Uh, Alexis Dean Jones, artist and animator. And Madeline Berger, environment artist. And this tiny team pulled something really great off here. This is one of my favorite games we've played this year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know we said uh, two episodes ago when we were talking about Overboard as like, oh, this is like straight into the hearts of the short game podcast. Uh, I feel like this is quite the run now. We had we had the game we covered last week, but, <laughs> but, but, but we're making up for but, it. But I, this one, this this is like, I mean, it, you know, it's almost even more so than Overboard was because this is has the full, you know, it's a full game with full character and full, you know, Zelda elements. Like this game was wonderful, and I'm so glad that we played it. Mm-hmm. And for a quick overview of what Chicory is, so picture a coloring book page. That is the world of Chicory. So you are uh, not the welder of the colorful paintbrush. You are the janitor. Oops, the world lost all of its color. Now you've got to pick up the brush and the mantle and move forward. Of course, it's more complicated than that. Uh, but a lot of it is you taking the brush and restoring color to the world and also selling puzzles and helping friends and maybe drawing a few self portraits. Yay. (laughs) Yeah. And doing little coloring, like just mini games that are just like, Hey, just like color this thing, you know, like tell us express joy in a, in a painting. Uh, And and if it sounds like you're actually uh, your character is walking around with the brush, it's actually, it's, it's more interesting because you're controlling your character on the screen and it's all, uh, you know, single screen areas, you know, um, mm-hmm. and you're controlling your character with D pad or WASD or whatever you're using. And then if you're playing on mouse, your mouse is just a free floating brush that you control also on the screen. So you're walking around and controlling your your little uh, adorable character. And then you're also controlling a brush that you can change colors and change size. And you can color in this uh, black and white, really, really beautifully designed world. And the whole game is you using this brush in a, in, in a whole swath of interesting ways to bring life back to the world. And uh, it's, yeah. it's great. Mm-hmm. So uh, I played on steam because I wanted to draw with my 
trackpad uh, because I I, mean, I design a lot and I'm very, very used to using that trackpad to draw intricate things. Uh, but not it's also available. <laughs> not, <perfect>. not the same. <laughs> <laughs> but it is available on uh, PS4 as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um- and the control scheme wise, like, yes, I definitely recommend playing this on something where you have a mouse or trackpad because of that, that, that sort of independent movement of the, uh, of the paintbrush. But if you are doing this with a gamepad, um, first of all, you can sort of drive the, it, they did a, pr- a pretty smartly designed sort of on screen cursor for the paintbrush. You can paint with a, with a gamepad if you want. And if you're on the PlayStation 4, you can also paint by using the tiny touchpad on top of the controller, uh, which I haven't tried, uh, but seems like it might also be a fun way to do this. Um, this game isn't yet out on Switch, but I hope that it does come there as well because I think it would make a lot of sense to use a touch screen for this interaction too. I believe it's coming out. Yeah, they haven't. I mean, I'm sure they've. I'm sure they're doing it, but they haven't announced it. It's not on their website or anything. So I, you know, we're not holding our breath on it exactly. I was pretty. Uh, surprised. They mentioned it to Kickstarters that they're planning on it, but oh, okay. they wanted to do it on um, what they were familiar with first. Yeah, yeah. So um, I want to flash back a little bit to talk about Wander Song because. Um, the reason I was interested in playing this game yeah, was uh, what a wonderful surprise Wandersong was. Wandersong, uh, back in 2017, uh, it looks, on the face of it, like a sort of a light platformer, right? And it has this 2D perspective. You're playing as a kind of a goofy bard character. The character seemed completely, I mean, obviously this is, you know, not just not just visually, but like two-dimensional from a character standpoint. Mm-hmm. Seemed like this goofy a uh, cartoon character it, in a goofy cartoon world surrounded by other goofy cartoons, right? Um, but what really was amazing about Wander Song was how the writing of that game uh, brought incredible, like vivid emotional life to this cast of characters. So, you know, you begin the game as this like completely, um, uh, you know, Pollyanna-ish uh, you know, a uh, bard who just wants to sing and bring joy and make friends. And he then spends uh, the entire length of the game uh, meeting characters who are facing the end of the world and personal tragedies and somehow manages to maintain that that positivity about saving the world with song and and then make it feel to you like that's a reasonable approach, right? Like that. The amazing thing about that game was like it it just did an amazing job of bringing a, a sense of hope and positivity um, to a to a situation that like grew intensely dire by the end of that game. And and as a result, it really made me feel hopeful at a time when I really needed that. And so I was I just enormously admired that game and what it did. It is so tough to thread the line between being positive, even when you feel bad. And Wander Song was a case that the character could be in a bad situation and feel bad and still have hope for the future. And it is very tough to do that and not be annoying. Yeah. Wander Song threaded that line very well. It was amazing. And I mean, like, obviously, it's a, it's a well-designed game. It had good art. It had good music. But I think the writing was what really sold it. Yeah. And to a degree, that's true here, too. Although in in many ways, this game improves on Wander Song in terms of the mechanics. This is more fun to play than Wander Song for me. Um, And it it still maintains a lot of that feel of like um, bringing uh, cartoonish, very simple characters to actual emotional life through good writing. Yeah, I think, you know, Wander Song is awesome and for all the reasons you said, but I do think this, this game kind of has both. It, it's, it's a wonderfully written, it's funny. And I think it was a little bit more immediately engaging from its mechanics and it's, uh, and just like the, the gameplay of it. Wander song was fun too, but like this scratches so many itches that I think we all have, you know, uh, Zelda style maps and exploration puzzles, uh, and then there's some more action elements that reminded me of the fight systems in Undertale, which mm-hmm. were yeah, absolutely were really this, good. This really wears its Undertale and Earthbound uh, influences yeah. on its sleeve, in addition to the obvious Zelda comparison. Yeah, I, I think even some of the music is like intentionally referential to Undertale. Uh, it, yeah, it, it is, and it's it's just a lot of fun. It's a great mix. More of it, please. Like this is a uh, 
well-balanced game on every angle from the gameplay to the writing to the music to everything. very briefly earlier set up the like the beginning of the or the, the setup for the story but I want to drill in a little bit further the first thing that you see when you're you know when you begin this game obviously you're in this like in this world that has color and you're a janitor in the tower of the the brush wielder the person who brings color to the world um, you are their biggest fan that is chicory by the way very confusing uh, if you are just looking up this game the main character the dog is not chicory chicory is the rabbit that is the sort of former brush wielder before the action of the game it's like the movie uh, coco you know it's not a, coco is not the main character at all exactly yeah yeah and momentary side digression Chicory, if you just search it, definitely a food ingredient. Yeah. Uh, so chicory game. Also, everybody in this game is named after a food. So before we get into the detail, yes. I would love to know what's your favorite food, a.k.a. your name. Uh, this is I love that. I love that so much that it doesn't ask you what do you want to name your character. It asks you what is your favorite food because this is a world where every character is named yeah. after food. So what did everybody name your favorite food slash uh, painting dog. Well, I think I already exposed that with the name that I said at the beginning of the podcast, which was they, the first thing you interact with this game. What is your favorite food? Pizza. And then immediately <laughs> it's like, hey, get up, pizza. I'm like, I am in. <laughs> the, they got me so fast. Like, that's probably the quickest. It's the quickest I've ever been like in on a tone for a game but anyway uh laura oh, what, yeah. what what was your what was your name i wanted to name myself butterscotch but it didn't have the last letter so it was gonna be butterscott and i thought that was too silly yeah. so i i played the demo i knew so i caramel. oh okay mm. wait what what was it oh caramel so did ah, you meet okay. there was another there's another character named caramel mm -hmm. yeah that's yeah. that's so funny mine was uh mine was pasta which uh, <laughs> Was great. Pasta yeah. the dog. Did I? Was, God, Pasta uh, the dog is such a good name. I loved it. I'll have to find the screenshot. So one of the first things you get to do too is design your own shirt. And uh, so I had a shirt and I tr tried to draw like a little slice of pizza. So my mm -hmm. dog was walking around wearing a pizza shirt being called pizza and everything. I was like, I, I didn't I didn't know that I would love this. I wouldn't think that I would love this if you just told me like, you know, they're going to trick you into naming your character after whatever you put your, like your favorite food. It's like, it's so good. It's so funny. And it just fits the tone of the game so well. And it's just funny all the time. They're like, pizza, we need your help. Or like, oh, oh, <laughs> oh, pizza. I, what would we do without you? And I'm like, finally, a game that gets it. <laughs> yeah. Or like in those really emotional moments where it's like, I'm just, I'm just so glad you're here with me. Pasta. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, it's 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 wonderful. I loved it. I love. I continued to love that my dog was named Pasta for the entire. It's, it's never game. not funny. I, I would. It's I would, never not good. You know what I would love to see, and and I don't know if maybe this is. I, I doubt it, but if it is in here, you can tell me because uh, I've not gotten all the way to the end. But I'd love to see the stats on what is like the most named dog. Oh, you I know, would love to see that. like what I would love what to is see that. like. Because I'm sure, you know, they, they could pull that from, from Steam or something. Like, what is the most, like, you know, 14% of dogs were named pizza. You know? <laughs> it was required as your Kickstarter backer question. So when you were getting your stuff, they said, what's your favorite food? And so they do have that data for the Kickstarter poll, and I can share it. Nice. Oh, I'd love they to They used that. that to make sure they had enough um, letters 
and mm. the name. Oh, Smart. funny. Yeah, that's great. So your pasta dog or whatever <laughs> is uh, is the janitor to Chicory, the current wielder of the brush. And then, you know, Laura mentioned there's an event and it's a little unclear exactly what causes it. But suddenly all the, the color drains out of the world. And you can't find Chicory, the the bunny rabbit who you so idolize and who is the current uh, artist. And so you pick up the brush. And the first bit is just sort of you trying to find Chicory and get the brush back to her. But uh, you pretty quickly discover, and I don't think this is a spoiler because it happens in the first chapter, that, you know, Chicory is basically just depressed, you know, you're, you you find Chicory and she's sort of holed up in a very classic sort of depression hole. Like she's, you know, in a, in a messy bedroom in her in her artist's tower and the sort of, you know, hero of the earth or earth or whatever this is, the uh, the what is the it called? Picnic the, the, province. the picnic province, the hero <laughs> of the picnic province um, is is just really going through some shit. Uh, and that was the first time when I was re- realized, oh, right. That's what this team does so well. This like this moment where you've got these like cartoon characters and suddenly they're facing real problems. And the uh, you know, it, it I think does a very, very good job of depicting depression. And, um, you know, a big part of this game is, you know, you're taking over this difficult job of being the wielder uh, and you're doing it in a sort of an arbitrary way. You weren't really out to be the wielder. Um, it's something that got kind of foisted on you uh, by a depressed and upset rabbit. Uh, and there's a lot of complex emotions that are actually dealt with here. So like yeah. you know, dealing with what is the what are the root causes of, of Chicory's depression and, and how can you as as her uh, you know, new friend try to help without without, you know, making things worse. Um, and your, your own feelings about like, as the, as the new wielder, like, did, did I get past this torch just because I was there? What did, do I actually deserve this? Um, the, uh, you know, how can I, uh, how, how can this dog that, that is, objectively a worse artist than Chicory. <laughs> yes, Chicory um, is great. Well, Chicory's art, when you see it, is just gorgeous, and you are doing MS Paint. And this game does an amazing job of like making you, the the player, feel like, you know what, actually, yes, you, player, are just coloring MS Paint splotches all over this world, but that art is valid. And by the end of this game, I felt like, you know what, I am an artist. Yeah. I feel good about painting this world. You know what? Everything I painted in this is it looks well, great actually. I think it so does many uh, feelings they do about some, art. Yeah, they mm-hmm. do some I think they do some takes on art criticism in this game too and like s- stature and what it does to someone's perspective of your art, you know, mm-hmm. and like they're really early on uh you get I mentioned it earlier, but you you're given a blank canvas, and they're like, "Oh, the new wielders here, you know, do a painting that that expresses joy." And I am awful at at any sort of drawing, coloring, anything. I'm just bad at it. So then, you know, try to melt that down into doing it on a trackpad with big splotchy things. And I did like like a little rainbow with stars and a sun, and it looks awful and then you show it to everyone and they're like oh what a that's the, the, wonderful the artist, like, like everyone the, is everyone is thrilled with your yeah, art except for and one you know person it, who's like i, I really felt oh. who's like, who's like does i've everyone, actually been trained does anyone else is, is like, everyone else looking at the same thing which is really funny yeah i i, I it, it has a lot to say about like the nature of art and the yeah. nature of like being an artist and what makes good art but also like you know is is art good or like yeah. I don't know it's hard to say but there's just so much to like this has this has such a um a positive uh outlook on being an artist that it really felt infectious like I yeah. felt well, strongly about it while I was and, playing it and Justin was watching me play and I was talking about it and he said oh that sounds fun uh does it judge your art is there any way to do this wrong and I said no you can't do the art wrong yeah you can't do the mm-hmm. art wrong ever. Um, the only way to get the art wrong is to not draw. Um, you can't get through the game. But I think the most fun thing to me is also they asked things like, is art for others to help others 
am I still an artist if I'm not doing it for me? Right. Yeah. Yeah. They ask, they ask you directly, like, what is art for? And there's four options, you know, and then you get a little take on, <laughs> uh, you get a little take on it. And, and I do love the, just the approach that pizza, the dog has to everything. It's like a, a, a mix of like sheer optimism and then also like imposter syndrome mm-hmm. and, yeah. uh, and, and like fan boy, fan girlishness to like the, like, the role of the wielder, you know, it, it's almost like, uh, th- like those movies where like the, the drummer dies and they're like, oh, that kid out in the crowd looks like they could drum and pull him up on the stage. Mm-hmm. And they're like, all of a sudden you're the drummer for your favorite band or whatever. Like that is what's happening to <laughs> if the drummer died. I think I canceled the show. No, no, you gotta, you gotta keep the show must go on. I don't know the what music, I, the show must I don't go know. On. I'm wondering, I'm really wondering I, what I actually what you're don't, referencing. I don't know what I'm referencing. I feel like that's a trope, but I can't think of what it's a trope uh, to, but you know what I mean? I did see there's that incredible, incredible, um, uh, viral video that goes around where I think it was Radiohead uh, or who was it um, that pulled a, a guy up f- from the audience and he was just like this guy in kiss makeup and he just like absolutely shredded nice oh, I yeah. think it was monkey wrench so okay. yeah anyway um, oh, man, yeah. anyway I'll, uh, I, I love that sort of there's a whole genre of like a uh, YouTube video of like a uh, person who you don't expect to be good at a thing just totally owns and everyone's very impressed. <laughs> but that's yeah. not this game. No, no because not. They're, they're not good or, well, I shouldn't say they're not good because, you know, art is subjective, but, uh, right. It, it, right. Actually, know. I think this game makes a really good case yeah. that like it, uh, that, that the drawing dog is good, is yeah. a good wielder of the brush, despite their, uh, amateurishness because yes. they're, you know, they're, they're out there doing things for people and being uh, being a friend, but also just like really, really giving it their best shot, right? And that's the job. Yeah, right. It's like it's almost like insider outsider art because they say like most almost every wielder has been a, has been like top of their class from the well, art academy. One know? of the things I love about it though is like the, the, it, one of the ways that this really hammers at home is like you in the wielder tower there's all these portraits. Every mm-hmm. every wielder does a self portrait and they're lined up in order so you can go back and look at the history of wielders. And of course, you know, uh Chicory, uh your predecessor slash mentor it has this gorgeously framed and posed self portrait with beautiful colors uh, of this, you know, elegant rabbit holding a brush. And if you go down two or three portraits, there are stick figures of slugs. Like, mm-hmm. they're, they're, you are not the worst artist to hold this brush. <laughs> and uh, and the game wants you to make, you know, make sure that you know that. And it, it also sort of, it kind of tries to make it clear that, like, being being able to do, like, beautiful intricate color and line work and uh and detail isn't what being a great wielder is because you've got this magic paintbrush that does things that amaze everyone in the world and literally what it does is big splotchy jiggly ms paint lines that you can almost almost barely control no one else has color right the the fact that this game like gives you painting tools but it doesn't give you good ones I think is hugely important yeah. because the game doesn't want you to get bogged down in like being a good artist or a perfectionist. It, you know, it does continue to add new things to your tool set. You know, it gives you new brush styles that basically become like the, like make like versions of like Photoshop brushes that you can apply. You know, you can get things like a, like a spray paint style brush or one that stamps big stars onto things. They even give you at some point an actual Photoshop texture, which I found hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but like it, it never makes the tools good quote unquote. Um, but that really makes you feel like, you know, you, 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 are doing expressive fun things with an extremely limited tool set. And it got me out of my head. Like if you gave me like a digital paint program and said, paint something that represents joy. First of all, I would spend a lot longer on it and it would probably look worse than the thing that I dashed off very quickly in the, you know, with the incredibly simple tools that this game gave me, it restricts you to usually just four colors at a time. And it picks the palette for you, which gets you out of your head about like, what colors should I be choosing? Yeah. And uh, you have these incredibly simple things and it does the like wiggly lines too. When you paint something in, everything has this sort of like visual vibration or boil to it that has, that kind of makes everything feel 
messy on purpose. So nothing has to be perfect. This game is not about doing perfect art. And it really makes sure that you know that in every bit of its tool set. I I, I, was, I think it's so smart. Yeah, I'm going to take a lot of the lessons from this game, honestly, back to work because I often am trying to get adults to sketch ideas or diagram things on the fly and people get extremely scared if you draw too well. Uh, mm. If I had a partner who I used to work with who's an extraordinarily good at drawing like cartoons and she would draw like beautiful cartoons on the board and no one would touch pen to paper the rest of the workshop. And I had, oh. <laughs> I had to tell her, you're too good. Like you need to draw a lot worse for people because doing, no one wants to yeah. participate. And this yeah. game takes all of that out. So the world is incredibly polished, but when you are drawing, um, even when you are imitating a famous painting, it is something you could conceivably do a copy of. Yeah. Um, it's attainable. It feels like even if you're bad, like the game is telling you it's okay. Well, they constantly, they give you these little things that I would like, if I was just told about this, I'd think like, well, that, that doesn't really sound like my speed, but uh, I really enjoyed it in this game. They'll be like uh, really early on, you go to a little shop that sells holies, <laughs> which I believe are donuts, but it's. But donuts are <laughs> donuts, probably someone's name. Yeah, yeah, donuts, someone's name. All of the food in this game has has completely like not uh, food different names. names. Yeah, be- because uh, they're not named after slice. food. Those are names in this world. Yeah, and, uh, so, all the food is named. So you go to uh, Holy's, and uh, they're like, oh, which we- I I think by the way, I I suspect was a uh, donut county reference because your dad, it, the raccoon, right, uh, uh, runs the uh, the donut store. Uh, and I want to talk about the mom and dad at some point, but. Uh, uh, the uh, so good. the holies you go in and they're like oh we we're, we need to do a new color special which you just infer that means that they want like a colorful donut and they're like can you design our new color special for us and then you just get blank canvas it's just a it's a, it's a donut and you have to color it in and like I don't know what just hearing that like oh cool in this game I color in donuts or whatever like that doesn't sound really fun but when it was presented to me I was like. I kind of want to make a cool look, you know, so I like spent some time with it and it looked like trash because I'm bad, but it was still fun. And I, you know, I made the whole thing and then they're like, oh, thank you so much. This is beautiful. Then in the game, it becomes like the main logo on top of the store and it's there every time you walk past it. And even though it looks bad, you still it's like, oh, that's <laughs> nice. You know, like I like I enjoyed doing that. And then there are people Everyone you talk to that's around there is like, this is so awesome. Thank you for designing our awesome new holy. <laughs> and it just, I don't know, it's, it's satisfying. It was more fun than I would expect. It, so much of this felt like that to me too. Like th- this is something that uh, I don't know why it surprised me a second time, <laughs> but mm-hmm. like I mentioned how like what a, what a deep surprise it was to, to sort of fall in love with Wander Song and, and it's, it's characters because they were just so, you know, well-written and, and had this real emotional heart to them. And when I first saw that he was moving on to do this game, a game about uh, painting uh, and, and, you know, featuring animal characters, um, I don't know why, but I wasn't sold, right? Like I saw the trailers, I saw the Kickstarter and chose not to back it. Um, not because I, you know, thought it was going to be bad, but it just didn't seem like it was going to speak to me in quite the same way that uh, that Wandersong did for some reason. Uh, a lot of things about this game on the surface initially didn't connect with me. I don't I don't have like a deep love of art and painting, right? Um, and I certainly don't have a deep love of coloring books, which is really what you're doing in most of this. Right. Um, and and yet I fell in love with it immediately. Like yeah. as soon as I got to the point where I was interacting with the characters and the writing um, and, you know, some of the the sort of emotional cards were starting to show themselves, this game absolutely got me. Yeah. And I, I feel silly saying that because like I felt like totally surprised by this in the same way that I felt surprised when I. No, I feel the same way. I never, uh, you know, the whole like adult coloring book thing has been a, was a, mm-hmm. like, it's kind of died down now, but there was that whole fad where oh, yeah. like, that Super was weird. People keep giving them to me. Uh, <laughs> I, I never, I, I've literally never, I've never participated in it. Cause I'm just like this, I don't want to do this, you know? So yeah, like a, a game I, that. I, I don't know. I, I have to say like this game made me think like, 
uh, you know, I've seen there's like those adult coloring book apps that are basically doing what you're doing in this game, but like on an iPad or whatever. And this game made me think like, maybe I should No, that always seemed dumb as hell, but maybe unless I'm pizza, the dog, (laughs) unless I'm pizza, the dog, I'm not going to be participating in a coloring book. Uh, but I, I felt the same way. Um, another thing I was thinking about when we're talking about the, like the, the art, the whole art element of it requires no skill it's all just fun and 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 enjoyment and creativity uh there is still though an element of precision in this game which is some of like the action elements of the game where they do Mm -hmm. require you to wield the brush in a more precise way but it has nothing to do with creativity anymore it's like action adventure game where you suddenly are thrown into a really sort of thrilling environment and you have to be a little more precise with the brush. And I actually thought that was a, an interesting and good balance and one that I was not expecting because for the most part, the game is super chill. And then there yeah. are parts that are not chill <laughs> and they require <laughs> uh, you know, a little more precision. And I think that's a really terrific tonal shift yeah. because there is encroaching darkness. Uh, man, I saw the black trees, the roots, and I w- was mad Shane was not on this episode because it's rad and metal as hell. <laughs> Those tree roots, especially yeah. when I colored in one area, I colored them all red and they yeah. looked so cool. There's some evil. creepy imagery um, that can, you know, kind of sneak into this game. Yeah, and it's it feels like in one sense, it is wrecking your picture. It is wrecking the town and you got how to face it. Um, it has that nice emotional bigness that some games, especially when games are about emotional issues, sometimes it feels like it gets very vague. This one made it, it's actually pretty specific about the issues it's dealing yeah. with. For example, even when you're talking to someone who used to be a wielder who said, you know, wielders have a short shelf life they can't hold the job for too long because it gets to them you know, uh, the simplicity of the language is what got me they say literally you draw for everybody so sometimes that was hard yeah um yeah the, the one is like it's been a long time since i've been a wielder so i'm better now and it's like ooh, yeah yeah uh, right it- and it's not elaborate language and it's not childlike, but it is very straightforward. And I think that is such tough writing yeah, it, to nail. I know it's only so useful to like continue to make game comparisons, but uh, in that way, I did think of Night in the Woods as well, mm-hmm. very much so. Um, yeah, I made that comparison a lot when we were talking about Wander Song. Yeah, they both had that sort of like you know cute cartoon characters with real emotional with, lives. Yeah, and dealing with like yeah, it's an insane world but the problems they're facing are problems that we all face you know and they're and and they're real to them you know there's there's a fantastical element to it of course but it's uh but they're taking it seriously and uh they have real emotional responses to the things that are happening to them one thing that i uh did appreciate though is that they don't really uh for all of the the takes on uh, art, art criticism, high art, low art, or whatever. It never steeps as low as your entry, like art history class. Like, is this art? And I really, no. <laughs> I really am glad that they they skip past that question. Yeah, that- <laughs> because the answer is so self evident. Of course, it is in this world. And yeah, you know, it, yeah, yeah. Everything, everything you do, every random purple splotch on everything the ground, you do. Art is art and it's and and also every bit of it is worthwhile because you're bringing color to a world that is completely yeah. lacking it. So it doesn't matter if it's bad, it's color, it's beautiful. I was waiting for an upside down toilet seat for some, you know, or upside down <laughs> urinal and they're just be like, "Oh, you colored it, but is that actually, you know." And I'm glad they just skipped right over that whole stupid uh question and moved right into more nuanced art questions. It has more nuance than you expect. Yeah. It's about what art does to the creator just as much as what art does for the world. And I think that's really, I uh, have started a new job and there's a crafters channel and I felt like a bit of a decoy in the crafters channel. Cause I, I, I make stuff, but very haphazardly and people are making, literally making shoes. Someone made a what? pair of shoes. <laughs> you know, you could just buy those, right? Like yeah. we've gotten really good at they, shoes. They said they had to buy a special sewing machine. I and bet. Everything. Yeah. And I was, 
shocking. So I and, I'm, and this game is literally saying like it doesn't matter if you're enjoying making it. Sure. Post your terrible craft to the crafting channel, and everyone will tell you that it's genius. And then someone will post like a pair of loafers they've made. And, uh, I was hoping that they made their own like Jordans, you know, but they're like, <laughs> like no, they okay. made like beautiful flats. I'm sure with a yeah. buckle and everything. It's it's shocking the crafting. Um, but I, I was playing chicory. It's like chicory would say, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> chicory would tell me that it's okay and my art is valid when she wasn't being. Sad, super depressed, Sad. or yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when she wasn't being just the worst, um, yeah. I, I, maybe we should talk about a couple more of the characters. Um, well, obviously, I, we talked about the draw dog, his or her. We didn't talk about that aspect of it. The the main character dog ha- is uh, uh, never gendered in the mm-hmm. story, which I thought was a great choice because I actually, you know, I, at first I wasn't sure. I didn't sort of make up my mind about my about pasta's gender until uh, until sort of later later in the game, uh, and uh, it leaves that open for you. And one of the neat little uh, details that I saw a sort of a design thread that um, Greg uh, Lobanov had on Twitter that has a lot of really clever stuff in it. But one of the things he mentioned was that, um, you know, they... Uh, was that obviously they in- intentionally left the dog uh, ungendered in the language, but uh, this game was translated into a bunch of languages. Um, and so if you're playing in a language where uh, they couldn't not gender the dog, uh, it asks. And if you if you switch mid-game uh, into one of those gendered languages, the first character you talk to uh, will ask you, and then it will proceed from there. Um, That's so nice. I thought that was, that was yeah. nice and clever. That is, that's um, great. Where was I going with that before I Well, you wanted to talk characters. about other characters, and, I, and I'm just going to yes. use this, this to talk about uh, two of my favorite characters and also my favorite hint system that's ever oh, been yes. in a game. So uh, all throughout the world, and in very, like, gamey, just thoughtful game design places, like deep in a dungeon, mm. there will be <laughs> yep. phone booths. And from those phone booths, you can call your parents for help. So and, good. And it's even better because so you call and you get your mom first. And your mom will be like, you know, it's like, oh, sorry, I was late to the phone. I was in the kitchen, da, da, da. Uh, oh, you know, what's going on? And there'll be like a bubble that says, you describe your whole situation. And then she'll give you a hint that is helpful but it's still to a degree vague. So, for example, yeah. it'll be yeah, like... Her hints are usually just the sort of like, where am I supposed to go next? Or what was the last thing someone told me to do and I forgot? Yeah. Like, super vague, it's the, really... I, it's the, the hint system you should have in every game. If you stop playing for three weeks and you come back, please put that hint system in your game. Sign it's ups. like you you need to go to... Oh, oh, honey, it sounds like you need to go to the temple to see what's going on there. You know, it's like that vague. But then, and this is my favorite part. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> uh, there's like a, hey, 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 let me, let me talk. And then she's like, oh, your dad wants to talk you, to you. You, you see you the see little a hand raccoon coming. hand yeah. reaching on, kind yeah. of like she's like going to grab the Yeah, phone. it's like your dad <laughs> wants to talk to you. You know how he has a tendency to over-explain things. Do you want to talk to your dad? And if you say yes, <laughs> he comes in and gives he you grabs like, the phone. <laughs> yeah. And he gives you like a literal step by step hint. So if the previous one was you need to go to the temple, his will be you need to go two screens up, two screens to the left, and then put this code into the door. And then you get <laughs> in. And it's so thoughtful. I just love that. And again, these are like, everywhere there anywhere that you might get stuck where you can't go backwards there are some temples that you can get kind of like deep in and if you get completely stuck there's going to be a phone booth somewhere around that you can call your mom or your dad and get some help and it's i i just love it it's it's nice from a game design standpoint just like thoughtful for your players and then that that idea of like you can always call your parents for help is adorable. And then the element of the dad coming in and giving like a deeper hint. It's just so perfect. And then it, it tells you so much about the parents too. And then you can go and see the parents and they are hilarious and fun. They're two of my favorite characters in this game. And what's more, while you're on the phone with your parents, you can color them with the colors of the area you're in. So they – the color system in this, it always remembers the colors. It shows it on the map. If you color a character, the next time you meet that character, wherever they are, they'll be colored the way you colored them. I love that you can color your parents on the phone with wherever you are. And when you show up, 
they don't match their surroundings because the they're not in the city palette, but it, it kind of gives you the like. I didn't do city that. That's folk. awesome. It, it's yeah. so fun if you're bored on the phone with your parents, you can just color them in. Yeah, that's something I always thought was really neat. Was like if you, you can color in characters and then you see them all over the of the world, and they main their color so something this game really commits to is if you color something in it stays colored in in the choices that you made uh whether that's people or your you know or, or like you know the the buildings that you are coloring in that sort of thing and if you pass back through that area again your artwork remains exactly the way that you left it now, before we get off the telephone thing i just want to say like i was i loved this and it's one of those things that like i wish i saw more of and it's also a very specific nod to earthbound where you call uh your parents on the phone to save your game um and you know that was obviously a lot more sort of simplified because they didn't have like endless hint text for your parents to to say to you but that that feeling of like i'm out on an adventure let me call home and talk to mom it, it always has that sort of like um, little bit of emotional heart to it. You know, if you're in a, you know, in a dark and dangerous cave and you call mom and she gives you advice, it's, it's always sweet. And mm-hmm. I would do it even if I didn't need a hint, I knew exactly what I was doing next, but sometimes I would stop into those phone booths and call home because it was, it was cute. It was sweet. Me to too. See. Yeah, I loved it. I'm glad to hear you both don't forget to call your mothers. That's very good. <laughs> it's so it's so lovely. Uh and I I'm I was just so happy with that that little I know. It, it's the the whole game is full of that sort of vibe and that sort of uh um representation of what, you know, the story that it's telling. It's just like constantly these little charming, funny, fun things that like you know, we, we we spoke a lot on the last episode about like the power of writing, of good writing, and how much it can change a game. And it's like, I mean, this game has everything, but the writing is just constantly so perfect and concise and exactly what you want. The, the other thing I wanted to mention about how this game works that it, I think is really successful is just how much stuff there is to do. Yeah. There's a lot of systems that, you know, you can, if you're really going to 100% this game, there's a lot of little things that you need to engage with. The short becomes questionable if you do everything 100%. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, right um, so like, for example, like, you know, you're wandering around this world, you'll usually get some sort of like, here's your next quest from Chicory or somebody. And it might be something like, you know, find the wielder temple and you need to, to go in there and, uh, you know, and investigate what's gone wrong. Um, but you've, you've got to, you know, track across this world and the world is very full of other characters and almost every one of them has quite a lot of dialogue Uh, a lot of the dialogue is opt-in you can talk to somebody and hit continue to hit like talk again and again and again to get more and more and more little snatches of dialogue Um, and a lot of them will have something that's sort of their deal right a lot of these characters will have something they want um, and there's tons of variety to these sort of like little mini or or side missions that you can do for these characters. And there's usually a reward for completing those. That Often can be trash. Like, yeah, like a mm-hmm. new uh, a new like brush style, for example, or something like that. Um, so across the world, there's tons of little stuff to collect. You can collect uh, garbage and then trade it for furniture that you can use <laughs> to decorate your house. Uh, there's little uh gifts everywhere in the world usually in places where you have to solve a small puzzle in order to get to them and once you get to those gifts yeah yeah, very much so i was thinking of strawberries and celeste and Mm -hmm. you know you get to those gifts and their uh their clothing uh and those that clothing you can you know you can decorate and dress up your dog to look just the way you want and there are apparently hundreds of options for clothing uh there's uh Sorry, Nate, look, you look like you want to talk about the clothing. Well, I just have another thing that this game does that's so thoughtful. Yeah, there's so many clothing items. And there is a store in the place that is called the Clothing Swap. And what you can go is you can go and and the best I can understand how the system works is if you have like if you have witnessed the opportunity to get a piece of clothing, but you haven't, nece- you didn't necessarily do it yourself. Maybe there was a, a, a gift that you didn't get to, or someone has a reward that you haven't solved yet. Uh, you can go to the clothing swap store and actually get all of the currently available items uh, for your character. You just have to give in one of your existing items. So you can go and be like, 
well, what it basically allows you to do is even if you solve the puzzle or not, you will have access to the cool, you know, it's all cosmetic, the fun item that was the reward, as long as you're willing to give up one of your other rewards. So like you can imagine people, you know, sharing things online or, or whatever and seeing like, oh, I really wanted that cowboy hat, but I'm never going to be able to solve that puzzle or whatever. Well, you can still- Or I have to go all the way back. Right. Mm-hmm. You can go to the store and you can swap it. So it's just- it's it's very accessible for which is nice because it's all just cosmetic. It doesn't matter like from a gameplay element whether you have solved that or not. If you want that cool hat, you can get it without having to like solve. I it. mean, you can if you want to steal my look, <laughs> flower and sailor dress. <laughs> nice, nice. Which I kept picking up more items and being like. I'm already wearing the best clothes in the game. <laughs> I know. I had a yeah. beanie and pizza shirt, and I was like, "Oh, you're I, done." I can't. I, it's hard. I, you know, it's hard to replace it. I eventually got f- fell into the method of everything I find, I will put on when I find it, and then just mm-hmm. replace it when I find the next thing. So, uh, pizza was always changing. Yeah, I I found the best thing, which is that you can go to a hair salon in yep. uh in the what what's the, it, dinners, dinner the big city. And uh, and you can get choose from a variety of different hairstyles. So so my dog had uh, high hair, you know, a big bouffant, uh, and a little bow, and a variety of dresses worn throughout the game, constantly changing them as I found new ones. And I had a lot of fun with that. It was it was just super super cute and fun. Um, and there's so many systems like that. Like there's so much customization you can do here. You know, obviously you're coloring in the world and you're doing art on every screen and it just becomes this massive art project of filling in the map. But there's also, uh, you know, you collecting arts, collecting brush styles, collecting lost kittens that show up everywhere in the world, um, solving little problems for folks. You know, you, you run into like, uh, like I ended up a, at a, a, a hotel and there was a, a mystery where all of the furniture had been stolen from one of the hotel rooms and you have to go solve the mystery and like tons of little things like that. Um little side quests and little micro stories everywhere. And it really gives you an opportunity to like, feel like you've fallen in love with this world. It's, it's just, it's really special. And it breaks up the drawing, which is Mm -hmm. great because when you're in a traversal or a new area, um, you will need to do coloring. And it, one of my favorite things is that the mechanics incentivize you to draw more. So mm-hmm. partway through the game, you're going to get tools to draw a lot faster as you need to draw more to move faster. And it's mm-hmm. a, it's a great pairing. They they match the, you know, you get to the art gallery, you'll be getting brush styles. Like as you get more reason to draw more, it makes it easier to draw quickly if you want to just blaze through it. But the other thing is the more side quests the interacting with the town members, the you can take breaks from drawing because you might want to stop drawing for a bit, even though you're the wielder. You might want to just talk to people. You might want to, you know, plan a rooftop party. There's other things in the world to do if you are getting tired of drawing. So when you go back to drawing, it feels great again. And yeah. I also think the art classes have the same thing because you draw a lot for practical reasons. You're drawing to move the world to solve puzzles. And then when you get to look at a canvas and actually think about the way you draw very specifically, it feels like a different game for however long you draw for. Mm. It's hard to make one mechanic feel that different. And I think that's my favorite mechanical thing about Chicory. Yeah, that's so good. Um, So I I have a couple thoughts and then a question for the, for the two of you. So one, uh, one thing that I lo- another thing I love this game does that some other games do, but I just wish every game like this would do this. Uh, as, as you both have said, there's a lot. You can just go and talk to random townspeople and they all have a lot of things to say. But once you've expired their set amount of things that they're able to say, you can no longer talk to them. Whereas, or at least in that moment, whereas most games yeah. would just like, they just end up repeat, like repeat their cycle. And that it just always drives me crazy in a game where I'm like, I, even though it's just a couple seconds to like rapidly click through but it, they it's, don't feel real. Anymore. Yeah. It's immersion. It's immersion breaking. So in this game, you walk up to a character and at least on computer, you hit space to talk to someone. And once you've expired all of their options, it just doesn't say space anymore. So you're like, cool. I'm, I have, I've talked to this person as much as I can. 
Uh, and then secondly, uh, I, I love how as you progress through the game, you are unlocking new skills for your brush and new interesting and powerful tools for pizza that allow you to access uh, areas that you were not a- able to access before. So my question for you all, is this game a Metroidvania? <laughs> uh, in a sense, I mean, I think, you know, it, there's a there's a um there's a uh there's an argument to be made that like uh Zelda games and Metroidvania <laughs> games have a ton of overlap and in fact maybe uh some things that we consider Metroidvanias have more in common with Zelda. You know when you talk to people like um uh oh what's his name? Uh is it um uh, You've told Igarashi, us nothing, so we can't. Uh, Koji Igarashi, <laughs> when he talked about uh, how he, you know, his design process for um, uh, Symphony of the Night, he said he wasn't really thinking about the structure of Metroid or Super Metroid. He was thinking about the structure of uh, of the Legend of Zelda uh, when he kind of created the the Castlevania series or moved the Castlevania series in that uh, sort of lock and key item direction. Yeah, and I think that's yeah. So they they are one in the same. I think that the Metroidvania genre just means Zelda, but from the side. <laughs> I say no, specifically for one reason, and that is you may revisit areas with new skills, but those are just so you can bypass the areas faster. There are no new puzzles to solve. There's just like new stuff to like collectibles you miss. Kind of fair game. You you can't get to some places until you unlock some of the, you know, new skills. Yeah, it does. I think it does give you reason to backtrack. And specifically for that reason, like you, you will, you'll see a big present, right? But it's at the top of a waterfall. Well, I can't swim up waterfalls yet. And, you know, I know I need to come back here when I can, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't mean to genre like wall, but I think to me, it's mostly that if that happens, you go through it's an immediate use. So you go through an area, you get a new skill and then you have to backtrack to the area and you use the skill. There's not like a third time you have to come back. Yeah. I just really wanted to ask the video game uh, equivalent question of, is this art? So (laughs) it's it's, it's a video game equivalent of how do I end this conversation? How do I grind this conversation to a halt? Is this even a game? (laughs) Is this a game? Oh God. Is this a game? I don't know. Uh, Uh, You know, there's, there's another thing that this had me thinking about. Like I got a good third of the way through this game before I realized that there are no enemies it, apart from okay so like there's no combat encounters in the overworld is what i'm getting at like there are the boss fights quote unquote um but even those are mostly just a matter like they're in the um in the vein of the things from uh from undertale where you're most mostly what you're doing is avoiding attacks and you're kind of you know using your paintbrush to to like paint things in but it's not quite the same as a as like a combat it doesn't feel like combat to me and it's very isolated to these special moments usually at the end of a chapter when you're going into a dark place um, to specifically confront something. Whereas like any other like quote unquote Zelda game, you're walking across, you know, Hyrule field. There's going to be a Bokoblin or, you know, whatever, and it's going to come up and you're going to have to hit it with your sword. And you're going to be doing that constantly as you traverse the world. This game, zero of that. There is, yeah. there are no enemies so to speak if there's ever something moving on screen that's not a bug that you can talk to it will be a friendly beast right right yeah maybe a yeah. little prickly but they'll be and, nice. and initially i was like you know i'm uh, when i realized that about the game i was like oh i like games with combat but i had never i didn't miss it at all here because it, it i was constantly engaging with the art mechanics and i I, I found myself so engaged with those, like much more so than I expected that like I, I was constantly involved and like really feeling like I, I wanted to spend time on the painting stuff. It was really something. And it's just constant tiny puzzles like yeah. the, the puzzling in this game, I think, is that good balance of it's going to be one part. It's going to be mostly figuring it out. What am I supposed to do? And then like a fraction of that is then execution. Normally, yeah. once you figure it out, execution is easy, but it's not always. Sometimes there's a little bit of, uh, you know, timing of things or, or finessing of things that make the execution a little harder. But for the most part, it's like, what do I need to do here? And, uh, mm-hmm. and, and they're all micro puzzles, you know, like sometimes there will be Zelda style things where you like, do a thing in one room that unlocks a thing in another room, which unlocks another thing in another room. And then it 
you know, opens the grand door at the end or whatever. But for the, but that's still all just like t- solving tiny little single room puzzles over and over and over and over. And mm-hmm. even though I loved calling mom and dad, like, at least for me, and I am not a puzzle master, I never found them particularly challenging or rather like frustratingly challenging. It was always like, you know, there was definitely hard, like, like satisfyingly difficult puzzles, but never anything where I was like, oh God, I have no idea what to do. The game is so contained, like everything has to be within this area that you're in. So you're just like, well, if I don't know what I'm supposed to do, I'm missing something. So I just need to look around the room a little bit more, color in some things or something and I'll figure it out. I also really want to praise this game for not having color based puzzles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Because at no point is it a, this needs to be red. This needs to be dotted. It's a great this point. Needs to be this game stamped. would be horrible. Uh, I I am not directly colorblind, but I have some colorblind like elements. And if, if this was like you, you need to have like this tint of red versus this tint of orange or whatever, like it would be awful. Or even they could have been like, this needs to be warm like the sun and you color it yellow that is not in this game's vocabulary it's always up to you what looks better or is like your color choices it never it never prescribes that in any way that's actually an interesting thing that i didn't think about at all yeah you're right yeah it would have been so easy to reach for that Mm -hmm. and they never did and i really applaud that yeah you would think they would run out of puzzles and then be like all right well we got to do color ones but like a lot of the puzzles, at least early on, it's not even necessarily like coloring. It's more that you have this like free floating trigger that can activate things and you mm-hmm. activate it by coloring, you know? Yeah. And so like it, simple stuff, like the first things you encounter that I would consider even potentially puzzle like are like there's plants in the world that if you color them in, they grow. If you suck the color out of them, we didn't mention you can erase, obviously. Yeah. Um, if you erase the color from the plant, they get small again. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of places in this where you need to like selectively decide which of the plants in an area are going to be big or small so that you can get through in a particular way, right. that kind of thing. And so it doesn't actually even matter that it's coloring. Like this could be a, those sorts of puzzles could be a different game. It could be like, a little finger that you, you know, click on the plants or, or like grow them with water or whatever. So it like, it's just, it's a fun element that it's every time you do it, you're adding color to the world or removing color from the world. And then you can pick all of these different colors or, you know, stamp a big star on it or yeah. whatever it is. That and you it looks do. so rad and caves. It's so good. Mm, oh, do. super cool. The, the cave thing is great. Yeah. One of the first power ups you get. So every chapter, every fight you get a, to bond with your brush more and you get a power up. And I, I won't go into details on them because I think they're really fun. But one of the first ones you get is that your paint will glow in caves and the treatment they give caves so that your paint glows neon in a very psychedelic way. Yeah. Just looks rad. It's it awesome. Look really good. And also the shout out to the sound design in this game. There's so many so, good little details. You can turn off wet sounds. Um, uh, why? But this welch <laughs> of one of the most fun things about I mean, painting is extraordinarily expensive in real life. But when I have taken physical paint classes, the the sounds and the smells and like the sound of the squelching paint is really fun. It feels very textural, and they put all of that in this game. So when you're just you can hold down the mouse. It's a wet game. Yeah, and you can <laughs> yeah. you you press and you really splat, and paint just comes out uh, and it goes. And then yeah. it'll, as you move through pain, it'll make these great squelching noises. And you all can, of it's worth. You can hold down the uh, your your cursor, your paintbrush on a, a on on like the ground or whatever, and it will just mm-hmm. slowly fill out from the brush and fill the mm-hmm. entire screen with color, and it becomes sort of like a. Glug, 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 glug. You know, as like the as the world is filling it with color, it feels like you're emptying a tube of paint. Yeah, it's it's, it's very great. good. And while we're talking about the sound, um, you know, we said it right out of the gates, but Lena Rain did the soundtrack for this, and it is so good. It, it is it's really good. This is a different. This game is a different speed than Celeste, so it's not gonna be 
you know, it, it is not as intense as the Celeste soundtrack, but there are times where she busts out that synth, the you know the one I'm talking mm-hmm. about, the the main uh, the main synth that's used on Celeste, and it it sneaks in and like, yes, give me more. But it's like, oh, it's like almost like an old like Ren Fair style, you know, music mixed with like a Celeste uh intensity at times it's it's really good and it's all on uh, on spotify and and it's uh it's awesome uh, uh lena rain is like just constant my favorite game composer i think she describes it as mixing classical sounding instruments with modern feeling structure yeah it's awesome and it's yeah it's great one of my favorite little design details that they um uh, that Greg called out in his twitter is that um all of the songs are marked as jaunty or relaxing uh, for the walk around songs. So they've set it so that when the beats per minute transition, there's an extra two second gap of silence so that the, you are not taken out of the chill or jaunty. Oh, Even it, because the music is cued by actions or when you move off screen. Yeah. And so when you're transitioning the tracks, they've added kind of breather time. That's so smart. Um, it's so smart. And I think this is going to be a very good lo-fi beats to study to type soundtrack it is it's it's a good it's like i've listened to the to it a couple times and i'm and i'm thinking like i've got uh, i don't have a big vinyl collection but the few that i do one of my favorite ones and what i listen to the most is the celeste soundtrack we'll just put it on at the house when we're just like doing chores or whatever and i'm just like i'm gonna climb the mountain that is this like gross ass floor that I need to clean. Cause I have two <laughs> gross children, you know? And so, uh, it's, it's really great to have the soundtrack playing at home. And I'm like, I'm going to, I don't know if it's, I haven't looked yet. I I'm hopeful that they'll release this on vinyl as well. So I can get just a big, beautiful copy of it. So I, uh, you know, I say this at the end of a lot of episodes, but I'm really glad we played this one. This was a game that, uh, like, again, I think something about it on the surface, you know, just looking at the marketing and whatnot didn't speak to me, um, but it, you know, it was getting great reviews and I knew I loved the team behind it. And so I thought, well, I've got to at least give it a shot. And my God, I'm glad I gave it a shot because it, it did speak to me in a lot of ways that I didn't expect. And yeah. uh, I, I just had such a lovely time with it. And I think it changed my perspective on art a little bit in, in a small way. And what I would recommend art? this game to <laughs> to everybody. <laughs> um, this game is out on uh, Steam and also on uh, for Mac and PC, uh, and also on the PlayStation Four and I presume also Five. Um, and I, I assume they have plans to bring it to lots of other platforms, but that's what it's out on currently. It's uh, nineteen ninety nine. Uh, Time wise, I believe this one took me just over 10 hours but i stuck with it for some post game time as well because this game has all those little collectibles and options and once you save the world uh you can continue to explore your beautifully painted map and uh clean up all that stuff that you that you didn't touch on and oh my there's gosh. a lot of incentive to do that i feel so bad i looked at the map and i looked back at the early game when i was only decorating the world for practical reasons and i have left some trash like just garbage splashes of purple on things where I just solved the puzzle and moved on and they look so bad on the map. And I kind of feel like I should go back and clean up the woods. Yeah. You know, I definitely fe- like reached a, a, t- a tipping point about halfway through this game where I realized like, you know, I've stopped just coloring in the stuff I need to. And now I'm taking about a minute on every single screen to mm-hmm. fill in the ground, fill in the sky, click on a few of the plants and turn them, you know, an appropriate color. And, uh, and you know, it's very, it was very satisfying even yeah. though I didn't need to for any practical reason, it was very satisfying to at least make sure that every screen had like a basic color scheme filled in for most of the stuff. Especially once you get that fill bucket, all hail yeah. the fill bucket. <laughs> oh, thank God. But I didn't get that till way too late. Yeah. One thing I did, uh, so early on, you don't have a map and, uh, I found a cat that I, 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 I freed a kitty, but it went into a space that I couldn't get to. And I'm like, well, this game is a Metroidvania, so I'm going to acquire <laughs> a a skill later on that will allow me to go and free this kitty. So uh, I just took the paint and I wrote really big just on the ground kitty and an, ar- <laughs> and an arrow pointing to where it was like in the tree. And I was like, there, now I won't forget where this cat is. And then whenever, uh, later when you unlock the map, it's like, 
I was like, oh, where did I draw Kitty? And sure enough, look at the map. And yep, there's this little spot that just says Kitty real big on it. I'm like, hell yeah. Thank you, past Nate. Uh, oh, man. My swamp was all hot pink. Like, can't get here. Looks cool. Hot pink. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's that's something I forgot to mention that I really liked about this is that uh, obviously, like, there's a map, but you can you can see the map uh, at with or without your coloring. And so you get this bird's eye view of everywhere you've been. And it reminded me a lot of like, you remember that, um, that, that like breath of the wild, um, DLC where suddenly you could like see your path on the map. And it feels like that because you can see everywhere you've been and, and the colors that you colored it in. And I don't think this is too much of a spoiler at the end of the game. You can see a replay of all of the painting that you did as a, as a, like a a sort of zoomed out view on the map and you can see it from beginning to end and you can save that as a GIF. The game actually has an option to save GIFs almost anywhere in the game. And I think that's wonderful. I didn't use it nearly enough. I would have liked to have made more gifts as I was doing things. So I have a gif of pizza, the dog. And you can <laughs> click on any painting you do and it will give you a gif of you making it, including erasing, which is very fun. So uh, maybe yeah. we should all share our self portraits. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, that was super, super neat. So uh, like really smart too. Like I, I hope that a lot of folks are sharing those gifts and yeah. uh, spread the word about the game. So yeah. Uh, like I mentioned games available on, on uh, uh, Mac PC and also on PS4 and we recommend you check it out. Go uh, get this game. Yeah, do it. Um, this uh, And you can find this show on the internet at www.theshortgame.net, which is where you'll find all of our stuff, including our searchable show notes page, where you can see everything we've ever done. Uh, in, and for the for the uh, listeners who may not be aware, uh, we've been going for many years now, as the, the large numbers on the episodes may uh, imply. You can go back there and search for games that we've covered in the past, even if they're not appearing in your podcast app. Uh, we have a limitation on our CMS that only the most recent 150 episodes of this show uh, show up up for search in podcast apps but if you go to our website uh, the entire history of the show is available there and uh, pretty easy to get those episodes um, if you uh, are uh, wanting to get in touch with us you can do that either on twitter at underscore short game or by becoming a patron patreon.com slash the short game uh, that's how we support the show and we appreciate our patrons very much and uh Every one of our patrons gets instant access to our Discord where we chit chat about the games we're playing. Uh, You can get previews of what's coming up on the show. You can talk with us about it before we even get into playing the games in in some cases. And um, uh, you can suggest things there. It's a great place to chat with us. And uh, and we love our little community there. Um, You can also suggest things on the website. There's a contact form there. You can find me on Twitter at Reagan K. That's R-A-Y-G-A-N-K. Laura, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Laura J. Nash. And Nate, where can people find you? On Twitter at Nate STL. And thank you so much for joining us on this episode of The Short Game.